Hey everybody, welcome to this live presentation of the Art of Recovery by the National Academy of Sports Medicine. And first of all, I want to apologize for being a few minutes late here. Uh, I had a few technical difficulties. I know on my end, I've been struggling a lot with good internet connections with everybody in my neighborhood working online or just doing something online. But uh, anyway, here we'll get it kicked off. And I want to welcome Dr. Marty Miller. So. Uh, Marty Miller is the Director of Education and Training at Technogym USA, and I've had the pleasure of working with Marty as a fellow master instructor for many, many years. And Marty, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you've been with NASM since the pre-Civil War era. Is that correct? Exactly right. Yes. I'm, uh, yes. 15 solid years now. <laughs> 15 solid years. That's fantastic. So you've seen a lot of a uh, lot of changes, not only with with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, but uh, on the topic where we're, we're going to cover a lot of changes in the industry with with recovery and and everything that that people throw into the recovery bucket these days. Absolutely. A lot of change in the industry as, as a whole. So this is a topic that's really fun to talk about for sure. It is. All right. So uh, why don't you go ahead and, and as everybody can see here, we do have a presentation that we'll be working through. So I'm going to let Marty take the lead on that. And as we go through, I think we'll be we'll be taking a few questions occasionally. And I'll also probably have a lot of questions for Marty and I may interject some of my my own nonsense into this. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks. Well, first, what I want to do is just start with introducing Technogym for any of the people that may not be familiar. So you'll see here on our next slide that Technogym was founded in 1983 by Mirio Alessandri. And he, we found it in his family's garage. And the beautiful thing about that is going back to 1983, you know, being in Cesena, Italy, he had the vision of technology and fitness, which really in today's environment, you know, technology has always been that thought leader, but more than ever, do we ever need that technology to be, take that data, to be having that connectivity with our customers, our clients, et cetera, but then also that amazing research that goes into that equipment. So it was just a passion that, you know, being a science guy and being in the education realm forever, it was just a natural fit for me. So you'll see here, this is our new uh, garage. We call it the new uh, Techno Gym Village where everything is uh, centered and they have over 200 people that are just in research and design and it allows us to just really have that cutting edge that uh, brings such amazing things to the field. So it's exciting. So, you know, as we go through, you know, I'll, I'll I'll come back to that. But, you know, Kyle, what I was thinking about was kind of talking about where this all started, that corrective exercise, that recovery. And as you said, since I've been with the company for, I think what you said before the Civil War, is in the very beginning, you know, people kind of snickered when we brought up the word corrective exercise. And they're like, just get stronger. Like that's how you prevent injuries. And we knew that we were way ahead of things with this philosophy. And the story I like to tell is I had to bring my own foam roller to the gym. It was that white mushy one. There really wasn't all this, you know, ability to have multiple different tools, which we'll talk about here. But, you know, I had to bring my own foam roller to the gym. And, you know, I was the guy in the corner rolling around. People are like laughing, like, what's this guy doing? And, you know, Kyle, you know, from your experience now, you, you, know, you go to a hotel that's unmanned and people expect to see these amazing tools. So, yeah. you know, Kyle, I know that you've spent a lot of time researching this. So, you know, if you want to give a depth of what's in that marketplace now, how it's come from just that traditional white foam roller. Yeah, for sure. And one of the interesting things, and this is something uh, uh, Rick and I talked about a, a couple of weeks ago, but whenever whenever I started doing research in foam rolling and starting do it, doing some research for my, for my book and I worked for the foam rolling company, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel around and meet a lot of different people that, you know, a lot of them loved foam rolling and they integrated into their daily practice and a lot of them uh, didn't, they weren't quite convinced yet. And I remember meeting an, an old physical therapist. She was probably in her late 60s and uh, she she kind of walked by and looked at our tools and she she just kind of snickered and she said like you guys think you're onto something but 50 years ago I was cutting off those contoured wooden table legs and I was yeah. giving those to my clients so they could take them home and try to maintain uh, some of the soft tissue changes she was making so just like you said it, it's really 
it's not anything that's that's incredibly new. Um, however, it's just now, I would say the past five years, it's really starting to gain popularity. And I think a lot of it goes back to what you said about technology. A lot of the advancements in technology have finally made this something that people think is cool and and exciting. And we see that. I uh, hope it's OK if I if I drop some names here, but we see that with a lot of the uh, hyper ice equipment, a lot of their vibration technology, the the percussion with the hypervolt. So a lot of that stuff, it now is is cool and people yeah. like using it. Absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, there's a slide later, I'll talk about it. So I'll, I'll preview it. But Technogym, you know, has an Olympic heritage. And the reason I like to bring that up is, you know, being chosen to be the sole provider of equipment for the last soon to be eight Olympic Games. Obviously, we got to pause this year. But, you know, my background, my first career was in professional sports, and I dabbled back in that at some at a later point. And the reason I bring that up is a lot of these trends that we see in the fitness industry start in that professional sports world. And, you know, we've had athletes do recovery forever, and I'll show that slide here in a little bit. But, you know, now moving forward, we see here, you know, one of our colleagues, Rick Ritchie, has his own facility in New York City based on recovery. Like you don't go in there to work out. You go in there to – I joke with Rick, go in there to relax. But yeah. he's going through the greatest science and he's got people now coming into his facility that they, you know, they train elsewhere. They might train in one of his other facilities. But this is a time that they come in just to focus on that recovery component. So I'm so glad because – you know, we've been using these techniques forever with elite athletes. Why wouldn't we? I like to use that term. Everybody's an athlete. So if I'm training hard and I'm going through different protocols, why would I still not want those best practices in that recovery? And that's, you know, you, like you said, spent so much time in this field. So, you know, the kind of the four key points that I like to touch about when we look at recovery, it's not just rest. There's a, a, a multitude of things that factor into that. So we've, you know, we've got the definition of recovery, which is that systematic physiological and psychological process in which the body and brain together require that replenishment and you know rejuvenation so they can be ready for what's next then we've got the rest we've got refuel and regenerate and we'll cover those you know but as we move towards the next slide there's kind of like a, another layer we can dive into that that six dimensions of fitness you got to take into your occupational stress you got to take in physical that social the intellectual and spiritual and emotional and working for an international brand like techno gym i love it i get to travel a lot yeah. and you know i know that you've got a cool saying but you know before i, I throw that over to you is you know, I travel different time zones a lot with Technogym. I go from country to country and, you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I can I can adjust quickly. But I got to I got to focus that. Am I really adjusting? Am I really getting the right restorative sleep? And do I have to adjust my training now because of that? And I think a lot of people, those CEO types that brag and all these people are like, I only need four hours sleep. Do you really? And, you know, Kyle, you and I were talking earlier. I know you got a great way to kind of phrase that in. Yeah, well, one of the first things, if we if we just go back to to looking at recovery, I think it's it's really important to understand that recovery it's a it's a multi level or a multi dimensional kind of a, a a process or an aspect that we need to take into consideration. So just like you said, the psychological, the the physiological, and even that that social component. So all of those are huge. They play a big part in recovery. And one of the things I like about what what it is Rick is doing with his with his recover uh, facilities, his studios, is it's actually making it a a planned. It's a planned activity. So we need to understand that recovery is as important as the training itself. So instead of seeing it as, you know, at the end of a workout, I'll just take a few minutes to roll. I'll take a few minutes to use, you know, whatever we have laying around uh, because it feels good, which is fine. But we also need to be planning it in there. What days are you going to do specific recovery work? And what is that specific recovery work going to be? Is it going to be... Uh, like we'll talk about in a little bit, a corrective exercise program. Are you planning days to visit a recover studio? Are you planning days to to meditate or to try some other sort of uh, cognitive practices, which I know come up again? So again, if we look at recovery, it's very important. We need to start planning that stuff out instead of it just being kind of a byproduct. And one of the things you were you were talking about with with sleep, uh, a quote that I that I like. Um, 
And, and this comes from a, a guy named Dr. Walker, and he he was quoted as saying, sleep is probably the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that few are abusing enough. And I really like the point that you make about uh, people that promote the lack of sleep as being like this cool thing. Some of the greatest people on the planet don't skip their sleep. Uh, I was reading an article not long ago about uh, Roger Federer, who sleeps reportedly 12 hours a day. And he's an elite level athlete, of course, his nutrition's right, which we'll, we'll touch on some stuff. But again, that sleep, it's vital. You got to get it. Don't skip it because you read somewhere that somebody only sleeps three or four hours a night. Exactly. And, you know, you can get by, but are you getting by at your most efficient being, right? Like I'm an early riser, but I do the math backwards. If I want at least seven hours, you know, you just got to shut it off and get to bed. And if you want to function at your absolute best. So great point. I'm going to start, I'm going to steal that quote, but I'm I'm glad I know where it came from. So awesome. So just like anything else, we have to have a process, Kyle, you just, you mentioned it about having the process of planning your recovery. And, you know, I know more and more in the industry, it's going to be, you know, a focus, which I love, you know, we love being, you know, on top of that cutting edge stuff, but even though it's cutting edge to fitness, as you said, it's been around for a long time in the sports performance world, et cetera. So first we got to start with that assessment. We got to start with a process of finding out what is the problem, where, where are we at, whether it's their movement inefficiencies, whether it's a nutrition plan, whether also if it's a recovery, right? Somebody may have you know, great fitness program, but maybe they're not recovering enough. So we got to have those assessments and there's a multitude of assessments. It's not just one or two. Then we solve the problem. We fix it and we work on it. And then now, as you mentioned, we have to have our game plan for after that, that rest, refuel and regenerate. And I can go back to, you know, having the privilege of working elite sports. You know, we talk about this all the time with a warm up. You know, they see the athletes roll out just before game and they start doing their sport to warm up again, but they didn't realize how much work went in before they hit the court, the field, et cetera. There's 30, 40 minutes work. But then also after a game, they don't see how much recovery goes into elite athletes and the ones that really take care of their bodies. It's another 30 to 40 minutes. Now, in the fitness industry, we're not going to put those demands on people, but it's let's not forget that it's an entire process as well as the sleep, as well as nutrition, if you want to be optimal. Yeah. And one of the things on that, too, whenever we look at the goal of recovery, the goal of any great recovery strategy or program or plan is to try to reduce the the amount of time after training until you can return to baseline. So if we look at this, whether it is an elite athlete or if it's just the the average, the everyday athlete, if if we look at you know training and let's say this is baseline we train and then we would hit this dip if we can speed up there if we can reduce that amount of time then we can get back on the field back on the court or just back to working out sooner or quicker to help reach whatever the goals may be yeah and i think you know building off that point there's such a misconception in the fitness industry you know i've worked through all different levels of fitness you know in different age different population but there was always this common thread is I'm not sore. I'm not, you know, I'm like, well, why are you upset with that? Soreness is a sign that you're not recovered or that I overtrained you. I mean, that doesn't take a lot of science to just load somebody so much that they end up being sore. But we have to get past that stigma of, well, I'm not sore. Well, your body has pain receptors for a reason. It's communicating something's wrong. And I yeah. joke, but it's like, okay, if pain receptors in our, in our muscles are good, saying, yes, great job, and you're ready to go, you know, you need to be sore, no pain, no gain. Then why aren't pain receptors in my head good saying, hey, Marty, great job today. You have a headache because you thought really well. But again, it's that irrational logic where people aren't applying science. So as you're saying, if we have a specific plan, we go through the process, get people ready to go back in, recover, they should not have that soreness. Now, there's other things with the soreness, whether it's jumping into phases of training ahead of time, right? We know that. But clearly, people aren't recovered if they're sore. Yeah. 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 And now, you know, we move into the sleep strategies. You know, we've already kind of touched on it. You know, yeah, I love that picture. I give up. I'm so tired. Well, we want to prevent that level of fatigue. And, you know, we know movement efficiencies. You know, we know there's more stress in the body when we're not moving well. But think about going into a work day, going into a workout when you're tired. So, you know, I, I just did a webinar not too long about cognitive fitness, and we could jump into that. If your brain is not recovered as well, you're not going to 
be functioning well. You're not going to communicate with your movement patterns. And now we just kind of continue to exacerbate this problem. You know, so that's where, as you already touched on, we don't need to spend too much time here is sleep is so important. Obviously, we'll touch on nutrition next, but, you know, we have to we only recover when we're sleeping. You know, we do the recovery techniques, but we have to sleep. So I know you got some great points on that as well. Well, one of the one of the things that I've I've enjoyed here, I guess the past, I don't know how long I've had it, but uh, whoop. Have you have you used the whoop? Yep. Whoop band, and I talk about how much I like it, and I don't have it on currently. Um, but it is a you know wearable technology thing. It helps track a lot of things. It looks at basically cardiovascular load as a strain and, and all this other stuff. But anyway, I've really been learning a lot about my sleep patterns with that, and it it helps to 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 identify quality sleep. So one of the things, you know, I mentioned Roger Federer sleeps for 12 hours per day, not saying everybody needs to to do that. Um, But what we need to try to do is maximize the amount of time we're getting that high quality sleep, because that's where the recovery comes in, comes from, comes from that, the, uh, you know, the going through the different levels of sleep, which we won't get into, but really trying to maximize that. And one of the things I found out for myself, according to the, the app, it tells me that on some days I need to be in bed 10 hours a day just to try to reach seven to maybe eight hours of quality sleep. And then that will get us into sleep hygiene. So making sure that you're, again, something we won't get into that much. But the the blue light, the you know, are you are you trying to set the the room temperature right? All of that type of stuff to try to maximize the the sleep efficiency. Absolutely. And I've done some research, and I want to dig in deeper is on napping, how important that can be. Just even, you know, I thank God I'm a phenomenal napper. I can just kind of relax for 10, 15 minutes and have the brain check out. So again, you know, for anyone that's interested, you know, dig into this research because, you know, there's tons of new information out there as well. Yeah. So as we move forward now, again, we're, we're doing a big highlight on all the key things that you need to focus on to really understand recovery. It's not, as Kyle said at the beginning, not a one step process. So nutrition, obviously, I think that's clear that people understand that nutrition is going to be key. There's a lot of different diets out there and you have to be careful because, you know, it depends on what type of workout you do. If you're, uh, you know, a high level cardiovascular, you know, athlete, whether you're competing or not, just putting in hours, your recovery is going to maybe take more than somebody that's just doing a a moderate level of fitness. So NASM has just come out with their certified nutrition uh, coach and it's phenomenal because it's up to date evidence-based, and there's so much research in there on what we're talking about from a recovery standpoint, but also going through all the different diets that are out there too, because man, you've got keto, you've got all these other type of diets, and they may have a place, but also the research shows that if you're calorie deficient, you know, you're not going to recover either. So now that goes through that trade-off, am I, do I want to increase my exercise or do I want to restrict my calories? There's a certain point where you're going to get diminished returns. So, you know, these are just a couple screenshots of some of the content in there. And, you know, there could be a whole long webinar on all the nutrition that's required. So just, you know, the key thing is there is information out there. We definitely suggest you jump in there. So Kyle, if you got anything from a high level nutrition standpoint, feel free to jump in. You know, the, the main thing is I think it's important to recognize that nutritional strategy should change based on your training program. So it, days are going to vary whether, you know, carbohydrate versus protein versus fat need, all of that. It, it doesn't remain c- consistent every day. It should vary, again, based on your your training. Uh, a key thing in here as well, which is only, only mentioned briefly, but hydration is something that's huge in recovery. All metabolic processes require water. So the repair of any sort of soft tissue, you got to be hydrated. And that's one of the big things we see whenever we look at mobility as well, mobility and things with foam rolling. A lot of it has to do with tissue hydration. The effectiveness of your foam rolling is based on the, the quality of the tissue, which is based on the hydration levels. So you got to make sure you're hydrated in order to maximize uh, I really take advantage of any of the stuff we talk about in in my opinion. Absolutely. Very, very important. So a concept I like to talk about is exercise versus training. I'm going to bring that back to what we started about with athletes. So when you look at athlete, hopefully they're training, they're not exercising. So as I said, you know, Techno Gym had the privilege of being selected for the last eight Olympics. And yeah, it's amazing to have all the equipment, all the Olympic villages for the the Olympics and the Paralympic Games. But really, if you look at it, it's one of the best case studies in human performance. 
you've got male athletes, female athletes, power athletes, endurance athletes. And not only does it help design equipment that meets their needs, but it really gets to understand the best practices. And athletes train. They have a, you know, and this is how you and I were talking earlier. People have, uh, you know, they'll have a way they like to work out and they'll do it 52 weeks a year and they don't have a plan like you and I are talking about with their recovery and their nutrition and all that. And then they wonder why sometimes they get injured. Well, you know, athletes have off seasons and they purposely undulate their programs based on their training cycles. They don't stay in one phase for all 52 weeks. And when you look at the world's greatest athletes, they're generally younger than you know we are, and they have a lot of elite manual therapists, physical therapists, athletic trainers helping them with recovery as well, and they have resources that a lot of us may not. So if they have to go through these cycles and this in-season, off-season, and this perturbation of their programs, we need to focus on that too. And I'm not saying not to aspire to do high intensity training. I'm not saying not to do some co competitions in the fitness realm, whether it's, you know, tough mutters, 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, et cetera. But treat yourself like the athlete you are and understand why that this is there. So one of the things that uh, we do with Techno Gym is we put a lot of unique things in our equipment that other products don't have. And one of those on our skill run is what we call advanced biofeedback. Now, the beauty behind it is we can see in real time how somebody's performing. So we can see going back to the mindset of how people are moving, if they're efficient or inefficient. If someone has a differentiation right versus left leg when they're running, we know that could cause problems, right? We know that there can be soft tissue injuries, joint injuries, et cetera, at some point. But also we've seen this where someone's like, you know what? I got to get my extra miles in today. And it's like, oh, okay, fine. It was scheduled where you're putting in this high level mileage that day. But what if they didn't sleep well? What if they didn't recover well? What if they switch time zones and all of a sudden now we're looking at the data going, wait a minute, your, your biofeedback's off. You're not able to control your ground contact time, your stride length or what, you know, any of those measurables that can come back to a recovery standpoint as well. And then on our skill run as well with our bio uh, feedback from a, a sled push standpoint, we can do a preseason screen where we have people do a three uh, step progressive sled push and we get their max power, max power versus their body weight per pound. And then we can look to see if there's a differentiate right versus left, but also now mid season, we can test them again to see, Hey, you know what? Preseason, everything was dialed in. You were at 800 Watts, but we're starting to see fatigue. You're not injured. You're only at 600 Watts. Do we need to back off your training mid season? Which we've done. I've, you know, I've worked with those type of athletes. You have to modulate their performance. But also, again, let's say I have a high stress job. I'm traveling. I just moved. We're going through something like this. I have to have some measurables to know where I'm at to maybe I bump up my training or I have to bump up my recovery to make sure that I'm where I need to be. So, you know, I know, Kyle, you and I had some strategies behind this as well that we talked about. A couple of things over the past several slides that, that came to mind. Um, you, you mentioned the the Olympics, and one of the things I was recently reading is now that they've pushed the Summer Olympics from 2020 to 2021, how, uh, I hesitate to use this term, but I'm going to, but how detrimental that can be on the athletes sure. because they've been training in many cases for four years Correct. to peak right at that time. However, yep. now – Totally different. And it's not only the athletes themselves, but a lot of the challenges their families face because they've set everything aside to support the athlete. But now all that all that goes back there. So that's one of the things I found uh, interesting about or what you were talking about there with with training. And one of the other things here, you were talking about the I guess two things. The I was recently reading and I know people are different. You know, a lot of times people people love the way they feel in the mornings. So getting that early morning run, that early morning 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 work workout, that really sets the stage for their day and that's fantastic. But a lot of people, this kid doesn't doesn't they don't like those type of early minute work, work early morning workouts. And one of the things I think to recognize depending on the night before, of course, a lot of times it can be better just to get that extra hour of sleep. Mm -hmm. to get up and go for that run. So I don't want to necessarily 
tell everybody that they should just stay home and sleep. But I think that's one of those things, you know, don't don't sacrifice sleep if you need it to try to get up and, and push yourself even harder if your body can't handle it that day. And uh, one of the other big things is we need to take a look at this total training program. And occasionally, whenever it comes to optimizing recovery, we may need to take some exercises out of that program, you know, in order to maybe it lowers the attempt intensity, maybe it lowers the, the neural demand of the day, but something to to perhaps just lack of a better term, reduce the intensity uh, in order to maximize the recovery and the efficiency or the efficiency of the recovery that could come uh, after that training session. Absolutely. And before we jump into periodization, you know, you brought this up and it, it triggered me is right now we're working with a lot of our elite sports teams because they did not plan on COVID-19. And yeah. now they don't know when their season is going to come back. They are trying to communicate with their athletes best way they can. They're trying to figure out how can I get data and, you know, how do I see where they're at? And what if they rush us back into a season? Like, you know, they're worried about an increase in injuries, right? Because of that systematic process that these athletes were going through and now there's this disruption so very unique times but again it goes back to that they focus on all of that so we should as you know these you know fitness enthusiasts that we have to put those same considerations into our programming because things get disrupted for us as well and that's a perfect tie into that periodization having that systematic process so whether it's the opt model which everyone here is very familiar with that Improving human movement through stabilization, going into the progressive strength and the different phases, and if appropriate, you know, going through the hypertrophy and max strength, and then power. Or, you know, with one I like to highlight from a cardiovascular standpoint, you know, I worked in, with clients for years, and they would just go do their cardio. And it's like, well, what are you working on today? Are you in a stamina phase? Are you doing agility and speed? Are you doing power? You know, how do you undulate your cardio from a demand standpoint, impact on the body, as well as are you trying to make changes or are you just trying to, I did cardio today and I'm like, well, what was the outcome? What was the physiological gain that you did or did you just spend more time on a piece of equipment? So it comes back to just really thinking that entire process through step by step. Yeah. Awesome. So and, now considering step by step, we'll go into the corrective exercise continuum because obviously this was put out years ago, uh, 2006 is when it really came to the forefront. And Again, back then, people thought it was corrective. If you're not injured, just get stronger. Well, corrective can reduce injuries. We know that now from research, as well as sometimes for somebody that's brand new into fitness, this might be their entire workout because, again, it's a progressive model. It can be a great warm up for other phase of training. But the key thing is we're looking for movement efficiency. And the research shows that these four steps in order give you the best results. Mm hmm. And then when we tie that into human movement, we have three main systems that we're looking at. We are going to look at the muscular system, the nervous system, and the articular. So the nervous system communicates with the muscular system, which controls the articular system. So if things are going well, you have no, normal force length uh, tension relationships, normal force coupling, normal structural alignment or optimal. And then that gives us good neuromuscular control. And then we get a great outcome in movement. However, when there is faulty movement patterns, and a faulty movement pattern can be strictly just movement compensation and or now a lack of recovery as well, and recovery that we talked about hydration, Kyle put that in there, it's a great point. Now you've changed how these three systems work together, and now you get faulty or altered structural alignment, neuromuscular control, and altered movement patterns. And then a lot of people, Kyle, as you said, they get up in a fatigue state and they just hey, today's my day to go burn 600 calories and I'm just going to move however I move. And then they wonder why there's problems. Yeah. And one of the things whenever we look at a, a corrective process or corrective strategy, um, so in ASM's approach, you know, following the inhibit, the lengthen, the activate, integrate, the, you know, it would behoove me to say that uh, there are other corrective strategies out there, but they will always follow those same principles of the mobility followed by activation or stability, and then going into something that's more of a, uh, you know, movement patterning or that, that integration type of a type of a movement to where we're basically teaching the nervous system to, to move in a more efficient way. Whenever we look at injuries, the major and correct me if I'm wrong or or if you have a perhaps have a, a better way of saying it, most of the injuries we see are simple overuse injuries 
to the the soft tissue, the connective tissue, the muscular tissue. And whenever we look at an overuse injury, just as the name implies, it's been used too much. And so we whenever we see a lot of things like since you can see my head here like a forward head posture the the tissues up here become overused they become irritated they become aggravated so as a fitness professional my goal my job should be to try to realign the the structural the musculoskeletal system try to realign everything to try to reduce that that stress um ACL injuries are another big one that we we talk about in our workshops. Whenever we look at that knee valgus position, which I think people know what that is, the the knees moving in towards each other, the cruciate ligaments are designed specifically to resist that movement once or twice occasionally. However, if every single time the foot hits the ground, it's demonstrating that knee valgus movement or whatever whatever's happening, that is going to lead to the tissue stress. There's no time for optimal recovery, and instead of those tissues getting stronger, they actually become weaker, and then there's that one-time accident or incident where we, we blow the ligament or whatever. So looking at that corrective process, it, it aids in recovery because we're trying to put the, the organism back into its, its sort of a neutral alignment, neutral form, so that way the tissues can repair, the joints can heal, we can get fluid back to where fluid is, is supposed to go. So I think a lot of times that's overlooked or maybe misunderstood, but the posture and alignment is vital to proper recovery. Absolutely. I mean, we, we rebalance our cars every three to six months, right? We, it makes sense for our cars, but we sometimes fight it when it comes to our body. So yeah. same, same thing, the more efficient any machine is, you know, it's doing what it's supposed to do and there's balance and symmetry there. So great, great points. So here, you know, now you're going to start to see finally, I think there's a, a push where there's that overtraining syndrome, things that where people are starting to identify that they're overtraining. So again, if you're overtraining and now you're cutting calories, now you're going to recover even less. We already hit the sleep. Uh, you know, it's so important. And then that concurrent cognitive effort. So we're all under a lot of stress. We're all processing information all day. So if you know, I, I now view the brain like my bicep. There's only so many curl bicep curls I can do in a day or a week before I over fatigue it. Speak for yourself. I know that's true. Good point. <laughs> that's why I brought it up, Kyle. So when you look at the brain, there's only so many things that can process in a day in a fatigue and not get fatigued, right? And you know, we were talking about this earlier. It's like okay. Earlier in the day, it might be easy to resist my favorite snack or my cheat food. But by the end of the day, when your brain is now depleted of energy, it's easier just to give in and cave into those urges because it, the brain, the, the, the willpower is just fatigued. So the brain is like any other muscle. There's only so much it can do. So if you're not sleeping, you're not nourishing it the right way and decompressing and taking that stress away from it, you're going to be overtrained. And then again, there's only so much energy deprivation you can do in the course of a period of time, you know, before there's injuries that are going to occur. So, you know, as we move forward, now we talk about that mindfulness, you know, and uh, meditation or getting the brain to try to relax a little bit. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Everyone has their function, their way to do it. I like to do this kind of first thing in the morning and then right before I go to bed. I want to disconnect. As you said, I don't want to be on my phone right before I go to bed. I, I find a way to kind of decompress and have some quiet time. You know, sometimes I'll go midday and I'll just go for a couple of walks around the block just to, again, kind of let the brain have some quiet time. And then I can kind of refocus my energy and effort throughout the rest of the day. Yeah. And and going back again, tying it tying it back into sleep with I think which I think you already you already kind of mentioned but understanding how important sleep is on our decision making processes so just like you said the the bicep and you know training the uh, the brain can fatigue as well deprive sleep's going to decrease your ability to make better decisions whenever your most favorite food is put in front of you um, and the nutrition like we said is vital in optimal recovery but one of the other things um Actually, this, I just thought of this, and I, I, this goes back a couple of minutes ago, but we also need to understand that um, de 
sleep deprivation also starts to impair how we can uh, process the food. So we have that impaired glucose metabolism, decreased testosterone, uh, increased afternoon cortisol, and all of those go back to your nutrition decisions and also goes back to the, the mindset, how you feel. Whenever you feel fatigued, whenever you feel tired, um, it's going to be difficult to make you know the right decisions and really optimize that recovery uh, throughout the day. So I think mind, mindfulness is is huge. Mindfulness meditation, relaxing. Um, I talked about this a little bit in a in a previous thing where you know we in a corrective exercise process we put foam rolling as the the beginning, but also in a just a regular training uh, session we would encourage people to foam roll first. And whenever we foam roll, we concentrate on breathing, we concentrate on relaxing. And a lot of times people say, well, it's pre-workout. You know, I need to get hyped up. Well, most of the time, uh, people come to the gym hyped up on too much caffeine. They <laughs> leave a job that they didn't necessarily like. They drove in traffic. So they're already jazzed up enough. Yeah. Let's take a few minutes and actually calm down. Let's relax. Let's start to focus on the training session that's about to to uh, happen. And creating that awareness is, you know, I think it makes people more aware of how they're moving. It may potentially reduce injury. I don't know that there's any research to prove that being more aware reduces injury, but it's one of those things where you're just you're just concentrating on what's happening. Exactly. And you'll see here and for all you fitness professionals that are watching or will watch this is, you know, the great thing is, you know, Kyle's probably heard me say this is education and or fitness is a race with no finish line. There's always new stuff. So if you want to be on that cutting edge, you know, a lot of your clients and people will come in as Kyle's saying, ready for that hype workout. There's a time and a place. Absolutely. But imagine if you throw them a curveball a little bit and now you teach them these techniques. If they hear it from you they're, and, and you share how you do these now they may see the value more so because you know they they think right now they're going to be a step behind us with the education that's why they come to us so it's going to be important for us to bring this into our everyday practice so that way we can be the leaders to help people who are want to get in better shape they're they're willing to work hard but if they're working too hard then that's not good either so it comes from us and you know as we get close to wrapping this up and see if there's any questions i always call it hitting the easy button in every other part of life, people look for the easy way out. So I always tell my clients, my job was to get you the maximum amount of benefits with the least amount of effort. And they were blown away by that. I'm like, if I wanted to make more money, of course I'd work less hours if I could make the same amount of money. Whatever, you know, whatever the case is, every other part of our life, we look for the easiest way to do it. But in fitness right now, there's this more, more, more mentality. And then we're wondering why some people don't enjoy fitness. They get injured. You know, they feel that they're failing in it and or they can't keep up with it so they you know just give up so let's make sure that we stick to the science and bring this new methodology into it as leaders in the industry yeah and i think it's i think it's vital to understand that the human body is an adaptable organism it will adapt to the stresses that are placed on it as long as they're placed in a systematic sort of a progressive manner and as long as there's adequate recovery in between that in order for the tissues to repair and reheal so instead of just driving this amazing machine into the ground every day plan some time to to recover whether it's a you know active recovery by planning a corrective exercise program or whether it's a passive recovery by partaking in uh you know one of the recover studios or some of that more technologically advanced uh, equipment have something in there to give the body an opportunity to to catch up without a doubt awesome well in conclusion you know i know we're going to save some time for any questions but i can't Kyle, thank you enough and NASM for, you know, having this, I know it's a great partnership between NASM and Techno Gym and we're on the same page, just applying the best science to give people the best end experience and the best results. Yeah, for sure. And I appreciate you making the time to, to come onto this. Um, with your email on there, do you, if participants have questions about Techno Gym, can they contact you or do you have somewhere else you'd like to direct them? That, that's absolutely great. I'm more than happy to take those. And I can, you know, it can be about the content today. It could be about anything else fitness related. Or again, if there's something from a techno gym standpoint, hit me up there and then I can get you to the right people and get you the right information. 
Excellent. That's fantastic. Uh, Greg, did we have any award-winning questions? <laughs> I don't know about award-winning, but yeah, we have a few uh, few questions. Uh, somebody in the chat wants to know uh, if you guys have any recommended reading when it comes to uh, the sleep uh, portion of what you guys were, were talking about, uh, any books or any, uh, any studies to uh, learn a little bit more about that. What do you got? I'm trying to think if there's a book that I've read. I've read some research articles and things. So I don't know how much time we have here. The uh, There's a lot of great research out there. There's a, there's some excellent books as well. However, what I would direct somebody to, and it may take me a minute to, to pull it up, so maybe I can come back to this one in a moment, but there is a, a wonderful course by – uh, a company called The Great Courses, and I find these on Audible, the the audiobook app, and it's an excellent 12 lecture course that goes through this in, this incredible detail um, uh, in sleep science, and it goes through all the research. It talks about a lot of books in there as well, and so if if we can move on to another question, I will pull up the name of that here in a few moments. Yeah, no problem. Another one uh, from the group is just how much uh, of this is listening to your own body or, or your client's uh, body and understanding uh, when it's time to kind of take it a little bit slower. That's a great point. I'm, what I'm going to say is if this is new to somebody and they are the type of people that like to work hard, I'm not going to listen to their body at first. And what I mean by that is if I know my client and they're the type of person that push, push, pushes, they may not truly tell me how they're feeling and they still may think that what they feel is normal. So I'm going to plan it. I'm going to stick to the science. I'm going to make them do it best I can and encourage them and show them. As they get some adaptations, they might be like, wow, I've never felt this recovered. Then I might say, OK, now I'm going to let you kind of talk to me through it. But the science is the science. We know how much sleep we need. We know how the, the right food and hydration. And we also know how much volume we should be able to handle in a week. So just because somebody tells me, hey, I feel great. I, sometimes I don't trust them because a lot of people are those overachievers and overdoers. Or you may have somebody on the flip side. So oh, I don't feel recovered yet because maybe they don't want to push. So. It's not an exact science as far as listening to your clients, but you really got to make them schedule it as Kyle said. That's the most important thing. Then after a couple of weeks, let's ask how they feel differently. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I would also remember that, you know, we're in a customer service business. So if you're not listening to what your what your client has to say and somehow I don't want to say necessarily appealing to it, but if you're not addressing their their concerns, then they'll probably move on to somebody who does. So listen to listen to what they have to say, compare that to the science. Come up with some of your own baseline tests. Like maybe you do a single leg balance test at the beginning of each session. And and if you start to measure differences in that, then maybe that can be a measure of fatigue. And you could probably look up something that's a little bit more validated uh, than that, but some little test. So that way, you know, um, based on yesterday, that it seems like something's a little bit a little bit off, not necessarily mentally, but not a mental test, physical test. Yep. And sometimes people won't realize they might feel rested, but they may not realize that they're off. And that's why, like I said, you know, the assessments and that's where, you know, I get the privilege of using our equipment all the time where I just put them right on it and look at the data because the data is accurate. It's going to tell me what's going on. Uh, going back to the sleep, the sleep question. So again, this is from, uh, something called the great courses. You can look at just the website or you can go to audible where I get it. It's called secrets of sleep science from dreams to disorders by Dr. Craig Heller, H E L L E R. And, uh, again, if you're a member of audible, you can, it just comes with the, one of the monthly things. Excellent. It is almost, it's a little over 12 hours long, all the details about sleep in, in those courses. Awesome. Great. Well, guys, that is uh, all the questions from the group, but a few uh, housekeeping items I wanted to go through. Just wanted to remind everybody watching that you can join us again tomorrow here on Facebook uh, at noon uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time for another Master Trainer Roundtable. Uh, where we'll be discussing uh, more on the CPT uh, course. And then on uh, Friday, Rick Ritchie will be back with another uh, live version of the NASM CPT podcast at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, noon Eastern uh, for all of you. So uh, thank you for that, guys. Awesome. Thanks for attending, everybody. Hopefully, yeah, you found thank it you. beneficial. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody.